Okay, I think it's a good time for us to start. So welcome everybody to RMIT Online's information session for our Juris Doctor online program. Before we get into the presentation, I'd like to do an acknowledgement of country. So I would like to acknowledge the people of the Woiwurrung and Boongarung language groups of the Eastern Kulin Nations on whose unceded lands we conduct the business of the university. I respectfully acknowledge their ancestors and elders, past and present. I would also like to acknowledge the traditional custodians and their ancestors of the lands and waters across Australia where we conduct our business. Right, so as I said, welcome everybody. Um, I'd like to introduce myself and our esteemed and distinguished panel of speakers today. So first of all, my name is Mark Charlery. I'm the Head of Acquisition at RMIT Online. We also have Genevieve Jordan, who's a Senior Product Manager with us. We also have Dr. Belinda Clarence, who's a Lecturer and Juris Doctor Program Manager for RMIT University. Also joining us is Anitra Nottingham, who's our Head of Course Design. And we have a real life example of someone who has gone through this program, Tim Scott, who's a lawyer for Lander and Rogers. In terms of the agenda and content that we'll be covering today, we're going to speak to some of the features of the RMIT Online Juris Doctor Experience that will be taken by Genevieve. We're going to talk to our industry and community collaboration with Belinda. A digital learning experience will be taken through by our Head of Learning Experience, Anita Nutrin, and some real career outcomes and some tangible examples of what the Juris Doctor can do for you, and that will come from Tim. And I'll then speak to some key application dates and what the enrollment process looks like at RMIT Online. Last but not least, we'll have a Q&A at the end, so please feel free to enter any questions you have in the chat. And now I'll pass over to Jen to go through what the RMIT Online Juris Doctor Program Overview looks like. Thanks, Mark, and um, thanks everyone for joining us today. I am just going to give um, a bit of a short overview of some of the key features of the Juris Doctor and the particular approach that we're taking at RMIT Online. Um, I guess at RMIT Online, we pride ourselves in creating programs that are directly relevant to the real world of work. Um, and that means that we create them with industry. Um, we make sure that they're university credentialed in the case of the JD, also um, accredited by VLAB, the Victorian Legal um, Accreditation Board. That we make sure the learning is flexible and doable for people um, to make sure that you can fit it into your life and, and all of the other things that you do. Um, and that we provide a really good level of support along the way. When I say that we build it with industry, I guess what I mean there is that we have an industry advisory board, a law advisory board that has input into the program so that we can make sure that it's really relevant, the content's really up to date, and make sure that you as a student have a really good grounding, really comprehensive preparation for a great career in the field. We also have a bunch of university um, staff who are researchers in their own right, and so they bring their research into their teaching too. Um, and we invite guest lecturers along as well so that you've got that expanded network of people um, who you look, can learn from as part of your program, which is really important. Our approach to online learning, we'll talk a bit um, more about it as we go through today, but um, I guess we always come back to this idea that it needs to be flexible, it needs to be applied, so you're applying the theory and the practice um, into practice as we go, and we need to make sure that you feel supported along the way. We know that most of the people who are studying with us at RMIT online have work, they have other responsibilities, and they're trying to juggle all of this as they go, um, so that flexibility is super important. We've got a wonderful academic staff team. And in addition to that, we have a wonderful team of student success advisors. So they can assist you along the way with all sorts of queries that you might have, might be about your enrollment, around um, accessing the learning management system canvas. It might be around applying for an extension if you need to. Those people can be a really great support for you as you go through the program and really important to keeping you on track and helping you um, along your little journey. So why study the JD and why study the JD um, with RMIT online? If we keep going to the next slide, you'll see one of the important things that we want to share with you is that we do have Commonwealth supported places for this program for this year. 
Um, so you're probably aware that that means that um, effectively part of the cost of the program is subsidised by the government. The remaining part is paid by you um, and you can defer your payment through Hex Help. Um, so for a lot of people, that's a really important consideration. And for the JD, that means that with the CSP, you would be paying about $16,000 per year compared with the full fee where the fee is generally around $42,000 a year. I say around just because the, the rates do change year to year and depending on the specific subjects that you take. Um, but quite a difference and quite an important thing for a lot of people. We do have two semesters plus an optional summer semester each year. So we have semesters starting in early March, um, another semester starting in late July. And there's a summer semester that goes from November through to February, which is optional. So if you want to accelerate your studies, you can do that. But if you prefer to have a break, spend some time at the beach or whatever it is you want to do, you can do that also. As I mentioned, um, we see flexibility in learning as a really important part of online learning and particularly in a program of the size of the Juris Doctor. Um, it is designed for online. So that means that um, you can do your studies when it suits you. Um, a lot of the activity can be scheduled around your other commitments, um, which we know is really important to people with all the other experiences and, and commitments that they have. Um, we do have some on-site activities as well. So, you know, if that's feasible for you and some something that you're interested in, um, there are some activities on site that you might like to join. You should note also that we do have exams. Um, this is an a VLAB requirement um, and the exams are conducted online. So you might be able to do them from home, depending on your workplace, you might be able to do your exams from your workplace, but you don't have to travel to some kind of exam center to conduct those exams or to participate in those exams, which might be quite a consideration for you. Um, we offer a range of electives, um, so you can tailor your program in line with your interests and where you so see yourself heading in terms of your career. So, for example, if you want to expand your knowledge of tax law or competition and consumer law, you can take those electives. If you see yourself working in family law, you might take that elective, for example. So there's a bit of flexibility there within the program for you to choose um, what's of interest to you. Um, and the program um, uh, is accredited by VLAB. Um, this is the body, of course, that accredits all law degrees within Victoria as satisfying the requirements for admission as a lawyer in the state. And RMIT is one of just eight um, universities which have been approved by VLAB for this. Um, and it's a very industry-connected program. Um, Belinda Clarence will speak a bit more about this in just a moment, so I'll let her um, cover that off. But we do have connections with industry in a whole range of different um, mechanisms, um, which is really important to us in ensuring that the program is super relevant and up-to-date. And I'm sure it's really important to students, whether you're current or prospective students, thinking about you know, taking on a program like this. You want to make sure it's relevant. You want to make sure that what you're learning is going to be something that you're going to be using in the future. And when we think about the course structure, um, if we go to the next slide, um, in summary, what we're looking at is a three-year full-time equivalent program. Um, so you can do it in three years. It's pretty full on though. So that would be taking eight courses a year. That is a very full-time load. Most of our online students um, study part-time and take at least six years to complete the program. So in total, you need to complete 24 courses. Um, there are 18, which are core, and then six electives. On this slide, you can see a bit of an overview. So you can see in year one, um, all of the students start with this Introduction to the Australian Legal System and Legal Methods course. It's taught in intensive mode right up front, um, and that really covers some of the foundational knowledge that underpins the rest of the program. So things like the constitutional framework, um, legislation, case law, legal research, um, legal institutions and their pro uh, processes, those kinds of things are covered up front um, to really set you on your way after that. And then in year, 12, uh, year one and year two, um, we also cover off a lot of the other core courses. So things like law of torts, criminal law, uh, property law, company law. These are the core courses. They're also part of the Priestley 11 that some of you might have heard of, um, which are the 11 subject areas which have to be included in all Australian law degrees. So they're largely covered off earlier in the program as part of those core courses. In year one and year two, you also have one elective course to do. Um, and by year three, you've just got the four core courses um, and the rest of that year is elective courses. 
Um, and then we also have as part of that um, the capstone course. So that's legal practice management and professional conduct. So as a capstone, um, this is where we really kind of encourage students to integrate and consolidate all of the learning so far um, and start to think about the, how that actually um, is put in practice um, on the job. So that means you're thinking about issues like confidentiality or conflict of interest, um, ethics and accountability in relation to the law and, um, and practice. Um, so really, really um, important opportunity to bring together all of the learning over the previous courses. So that's a real um, whirlwind sort of overview um, of the program. I might hand over now to Dr. Belinda Clarence, who's our program manager for the Juris Doctor, just to talk a bit more about how we engage with industry and the community, and also some of the other experiences you might be interested in, things like study tours. So over to you, Belinda. Okay, well, um, good afternoon, everyone. I'll just um, talk to those bullet points. Um, would you like me to wait until the end to answer some of those chat questions? So I did see a couple that came along in connection with uh, one I particularly noted was the um, order to um, do the courses. It's, I really recommend following the structure if you don't follow the structure, you're going to find yourself, um, A, not having sufficient knowledge because the learning is scaffolded, or B, we don't run every single course every single time. So you might find yourself in a bottleneck. So we structure the scheduling to make sure you can finish in three years. So um, students who sometimes just decide to do a third year thing here and a second year think they suddenly find themselves um, running out of road. So definitely follow the structure, the program. Um, so in terms of the industry and community engagement, uh, this has a number of different angles to it. Within the curriculum itself, we have to, as Genevieve mentioned, do the Priestley 11 core learning subjects. But we have other subjects, for instance, law and technology, that isn't a Priestley 11, but that's core for our degree because of the importance that is for lawyers. Um, so within the course itself, we address the industry um, experience through different types of assessment. So the types of assessment that you'll find yourself doing are memorandums of advice. This is typical advice that lawyers do to clients. Um, mooting, which is engaging in legal argument, um, uh, various types of group work, because of course uh, teamwork is um, very important, um, negotiation, legal interviewing, um, research essays, all, all of these are typical um, law activities. In our, on, on staff, your teachers will be um, academics, as well as guest uh, lecturers, partners in law firms, barristers, depending on, this, on the course, sometimes just guest speakers. So of course, within our assessments, we will have real world case studies, but we also require you to read law cases because that's going to be, that's a very necessary um, skill. As part of electives, we do have um, after COVID, unfortunately, we had to suspend it. But just in December, um, I've just got back from the uh, international study tour to Vietnam, where we took a group of students on the um, elective um, law and justice beyond borders, which is also everyone um, really developed a lot personally and um, learned a lot about the different law um, system in Vietnam. Um, some of you might remember the ex-Deputy Premier and Attorney General, Rob Hulse. He runs the Centre for Innovative Justice. So um, 
that's part of our, our industry engagement because the, um, the CRJ looks, for instance, they did some work with um, Collingwood um, to look at historic um, restorative justice issues for historic um, racism. The CRJ is also in July, which is probably a bit too early for commencing students, is also taking a, um, a group of students to New Zealand to see how their Indigenous courts um, work. The other important part of it is that um, we uh, are very committed to engaging with our alumni. So the course itself has been running at RMIT since 2009. So a lot of our alumni are doing very interesting things. So that brings me to the other point that a law degree can lead to many other outcomes, particularly in the JD, because many of you already have, well, you have to have a degree already, and many of you have already built up careers. So there's lots of different ways you can use your law degree, and you can certainly see that from all the wide variety of things our alumni do. I mean, these are, you know, obviously you can practice as a lawyer because it does lead to, um, it does lead to admission to the Supreme Court of Victoria. And you can either be a barrister or a solicitor or be an in-house counsel at a firm. Um, a lot of jobs in government, uh, politics, you might've noticed that many politicians have a law degree um, you can work in general policy, um, um, think tanks, um, academia, in media, uh, and in business. And sometimes people just leverage their existing um, uh, job. We are, um, I think it's been mentioned that we've got a industry advisory board. And on our advisory board, we have um, partners from leading law firms such as Morris Blackburn. We have magistrates. Um, we have um, for also from Victorian government solicitors department, um, someone from there. We have um, Judge Chambers from the um, from the county court. So we have um, a range of uh, very committed people who give their own view into the program and the various things we do. For instance, they are very enthusiastic about our um, getting an international um, focus. So um, I think um, just one more thing I think I, I can quickly answer was about the exams. There are 11 exams out of 24 subjects and the 11 exams are for the priestly 11 and they do take place at the same time. Which brings me to the point that it's not a good idea to study this outside of Australia. The reason being that the hours don't work very well. There's issues, for instance, in some countries such as China about blocking data. And there's also issues to do with the GDPR, which is data um, privacy. It makes setting exams across borders very difficult for us because the online students do their exams online but in an invigilated um, environment. Um, so that's, uh, that's that for now. I'll, I'll be available to answer any questions um, at the end of the presentation. So I will just um, uh, finish off there. Thank you very much, Dr. Clarence. Uh, now, I think we'd like to hand over to Tim Scott so he can give us some more industry insights around his study time and his new career with Lander and Rogers. Hi there, everyone. Um, yeah, so I'm Tim and I'm currently a graduate at Lander and Rogers. I'm just going to talk quickly a little bit about um, the kind of careers that a Juris Doctor can lead into. Uh, Belinda did touch on this. I, I don't have too much to add to her and I won't repeat anything she said. Um, some of the things that employers will be looking for when you do make that transition from law school into the job market. And then I'll just share with you kind of my my story through university and law school 
um, just so you have some idea of, of that. And then at the end, feel free to shoot me any questions. I'm happy to answer anything I can. So on the next slide, we can just see the sort of legal careers that a Juris Doctor can lead to. Broadly speaking, commercial and criminal law are the two areas that people have in mind when they think of becoming a lawyer. Um, it's not essential that you know exactly what you're going to do on day one of your JD. There's loads of opp opportunities to explore, to see what's interesting. Um, but it's definitely worth thinking about early on, especially with things like criminal law. Um, if you think you have an interest in criminal law, I definitely recommend starting to think about it early because it's pretty niche and narrow and you want to sort of start building up that awareness of criminal law early on so that you can find those opportunities. The other places that people go are government are lawyers and um, some friends of mine who are in this area find it very rewarding, especially if you have a bit of a policy or politics undergrad background. It's a great combination of the law skills and those broader arts skills. The other really interesting role that's out there for people is being a judicial associate or a judge's associate. It's not something I knew about until I arrived at law school, but the role basically is the legal assistant to a judge and high court judges have associates and so do magistrates courts. And you help with everything from legal research to drafting judgments. And you also get to do some really fun stuff like opening up the court, swearing in witnesses, all that sort of thing. Um, a few people I know who are doing this job all really love it. It's really interesting. It's a great um, career. People often do it for one year right out, right out of law school before settling in a law firm for the longer term. Um, again, it's something that's really worth thinking about early on. If you like the research and the sort of academic rigour of law school, this is a job you'll probably love. And thinking about it early, the judges often hire a year or more in advance. So again, not something you need to think about on day one, but thinking about it early so you can see where those opportunities are and get in with time to line them up with the time you're graduating. Um, and of course, the other thing is CLCs, which are community legal centres and non-profits. So they're often smaller law firms that are mostly donor or uh, government funded that almost primarily or almost totally do pro bono work for the good of the community in different areas. So Fitzroy Legal Centre, for example, just assists people in inner city Melbourne who can't pay their own legal fees. And then there are specialised CLCs like Environmental Justice Australia that just focuses on climate-based litigation. Um, outside of the law, you can go into government or policy in sort of the broader, not as a lawyer, but as a policy advisor or a role like that. Um, academia, again, if you really like the academic rigour and the sort of intellectual exercise of the law, further studies in law are always a possibility. And education in any other field, you can always go and take education in other fields and, and follow a different career outside of law. I know lots of people that have done that. Um, but having that law degree, especially if you continue to work in Australia, is a really great foundation. I think it's worth having in, in most jobs. Um, on the next slide, some points about what are some of the skills that employers look for when you step out of law school and start looking for jobs. It's definitely not the case that they expect you to be a fully honed legal expert in a very specific area of law when you walk into a commercial law firm and apply for a job. But what they're going to look for is sort of that, that those broader soft skills. So willingness and ability to learn, which is obviously demonstrated through having some good grades, um, maybe references from lecturers or teachers who say that you showed a lot of enthusiasm and were engaged in class. Um, industry and sector awareness. Again, don't need to be an expert, but if you're going for an interview at a family law practice, have, knowing a little bit about the basics of family law, knowing a little bit about what's going on in the news with changes to the Family Law Act, that sort of thing is a great look. Employers will look very favor, favorably upon you if you come in with some great questions for them about what they think is interesting in the field and just show a bit of engagement. Um, this dot point maybe could actually move to the top, but technical knowledge and capability, and what I mean is engaging with tech, uh, computer tech, AI, um, artificial intelligence, all that sort of thing. It's becoming increasingly important very quickly. Um, and I think I saw on the list of subjects that there are subjects in the uh, RMIT Juris Doctor that touch on this, and I'd really encourage everyone to get as involved as you can with that side of things. Having 
your own understanding of how tech and law interact is very important for your own development, but it's also something that employers will look on extremely favourably, and that's only going to get more and more the case with time. And then again, these sort of soft skills, work ethic, people skills, um, any career background you have, even if you've just worked, like I did, I worked in hospitality for years, it all actually becomes really relevant when you go to apply for jobs to be able to show that you work hard, your manager at the hotel liked you, whatever it is, and that you can hold a conversation with someone, you know, get along well with most people. Those are actually really, really important skills that all law firms uh, are really looking for in their, in their young lawyers. And again, I've sort of already said it, but passion and enthusiasm it really goes a long way. If, you, if it's clear to the person interviewing you um, that you care about what you're talking about, that you want to be there, that, that will get you a long way. Um, in the early stages of your degree, it's really about putting out a wide net, finding out as much as you can about all the different opportunities out there and seeing what takes your interest. Um, and on the next slide, and my last slide, is sort of my story. I went to undergrad in Wollongong in New South Wales and studied politics, philosophy and economics, which I really enjoyed. Um, and my skills in sort of philosophy and politics led me to think that law school would be a good place for me to get a more um, applicable degree. So I studied law school at the University of Melbourne. And the first year was in person and then COVID put us all completely online. And I know that this, this course is, is all online. And I think that's something that has a lot of advantages because you do get a lot more flexibility. Um, it does have some downsides in terms of the social side of things, but RMIT um, is aware of that and puts on on-campus events that you can come and make the most of the cohort um, and group projects are another way of doing that. And I think studying online is something that employers uh, especially after the last couple of years with COVID, are less and less concerned about. Um, once upon a time, it probably would have been, it might have been something they were a bit concerned about if you went to an online university rather than in person. But those days are over. I think if you've got a good degree, you show that you're keen to work and uh, are switched on, that will be way more important than, than the fact that you studied online. That's just becoming more and more common. Um, and during law school, I've got a clerkship at Lander and Rogers, um, which led to a grad program. And I've worked here in their workplace relations team and their insurance team. And I'm now in their tech team, the internal tech team at Lander and Rogers. And next year, they're sending me to work at a, a charity legal centre for a year. I'm still employed by Lander and Rogers, but working at Environmental Justice Australia um, in climate litigation. It's an area I'm very passionate about. So that's, that's sort of how my journey carried out. Um, I'll be here at the end if anyone has questions, so please just shoot them in the ch chat to me directly or send them to Jemima. I'm very happy to answer any questions. Thanks. That was awesome, Tim. Thank you. Uh, now I'm going to hand over to Anitra, who's going to talk us through why we should choose the Juris Doctor program of RMIT Online. Thanks, Mark. Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming along today. Um, I've answered a couple of questions in the webinar chat, so please feel free to answer uh, to ask me any more questions about the learning experience. Can we go to the next slide, please? Um, so I'm the head of course design at RMIT Online. So what my team does is make the actual courses, and you'll see a couple of little photos on the side there. All that content in there um, is uh, the things that we look after, working closely with Belinda and her team of academics who um, muck in and make their own canvas shells, put their own content into the canvas shells uh, as well. Um, this uh, program is, is constantly updated. So every time um, before the courses run, all of the um, course coordinators go through and check the content and make sure that it's accurate and up to date and reflects all the latest law. Um, so that's a really great thing about these programs. So I guess the main difference between studying online and on campus, I think uh, is of course that you, uh, interacting a lot more with that learning management system. We use Canvas. Um, so your learning is um, self-paced and is delivered through um, primarily through text, but we have videos, we have little interactives, things like that in the courses as well. Um, so your classroom uh, will always uh, sort of look like a, a, an LMS screen. And I guess the nice thing about online learning is that everything is in the box. So when you go into your course and you open it up, 
everything that you need to study for that um, term is in there. You've got access to the library. Um, you can go directly and get books um, that you that you need to read. Um, all the other readings are in, um, in the course itself so that you can go through that at your own pace before you um, attend any of the webinars. Um, software and tools and things like that that are supplied um, are things like uh, um, office suite and stuff like that that you need comes also through um, RMIT University. So I always like to say this is a little box that you unpack um, and that you can do your learning from anywhere. Um, the program structure, I think we already talked about that, but you'll find that every course is pretty much structured the same way, which has got um, learning content that you need to read before you go to the webinar and then um, stuff, the, your assessments that you do um, afterwards. Um, and they do, uh, you get access to view all your assessments at the beginning so that you can plan when your deadlines are, what you need to do. You get a good idea of what you need to do and what you need to hand in um, uh, at the very beginning, which really helps you plan. Um, we know that online students have busy lives. That's why we record the webinars. That's why we make sure that you have everything available to you before you begin so that you can know when things are due. We don't believe in what I like to call curriculum by murder mystery, where we surprise you with things. Uh, we like to tell you exactly what's coming up and what you need to know. Um, there were some questions about um, interaction uh, with your fellow students. So those webinars are a good opportunity to interact, but there are discussion topics within the courses where you can sort of, I, I like to say, chew over topics um, and uh, even maybe argue with each other a little bit um, about uh, things that you're learning. And that's a good way uh, to not only to sort of connect with your fellow students, but it's a really important part of learning is talking about what you're learning. And you'll find quickly that your um, that your family and friends will get bored of hearing about, uh, about your course and the people that you are on this journey with together will never be bored of hearing about um, what's happening with you and your course. So it's a good opportunity in the course. And as, as was mentioned before by Tim, going to any events that are offered to make connections so that you can talk to other people. Um, I think that's, do I have another slide, Mark? Or hosts, can you switch to the next next one? Um, right, I I think you're doing my little spiel very quickly, but I'm really pleased to ask me any questions in the chat. I mainly specialize in like how the actual courses are constructed um, and how, um, how you can access all those things in there. So thanks a lot. Thank you, Anitra. Okay, so now we're just going to quickly go through the application and enrollment process with RMIT Online. Now, I think the key thing to shout out here, if we move to the next slide, is that we've tried to make this as simple and efficient as possible. So I have already shared in the chat our program page on our website, um, which has a summary of information around the program, overview and structure, uh, courses overviews, plus information about fees and admission requirements. You can download a program brochure here as well. Um, and if you're feeling confident enough to proceed with your application, you can just click the apply now button, which will take you straight through to our service now registration and application portal where you can leave your information. Um, if you don't feel confident in doing that, um, then you can speak to our enrollment team who are available Monday to Friday from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. And they'll be able to answer any further questions you have and essentially walk you through that application process. Um, once you've made that application and hopefully you're successful in receiving an offer from the university, you can then you'll then be um you'll then be able to accept that offer. Sorry, I just have some background notice going on. Um, you'll then be able to accept that offer and you'll be sent a link which will allow you to go in and enroll and pick your subjects of study. Now our enrollment team do proactively look across all of our new students who have enrolled and see when students have potentially created a load that's too heavy to study. So they'll reach out to you and just make sure that it is achievable for you to get through that level of subjects. Typically, we're seeing people to pick between two to four subjects per teaching period. Um, but as Genevieve said before, it's quite a substantial effort to get through all of those um, subjects in a given teaching period. So we'll just work with you to understand what works best for you. Um, prior to your study commencement date, you will receive email communications from us, giving you tips on how to start your studies without a hitch. I think Anitra made mention to that before. And as I said before, enrollments team are always happy to help. So anytime you want to get in contact with us, we've got phone numbers, we've got emails, and we usually turn around communications within a 24-hour period. In terms of our key dates, so the classes for our first intake will start on the 4th of March, 2024. 
However, the last day to apply is actually the 5th of March, 2024. And then there's a couple of days grace to get those things turned around. So the last day to accept an offer for this teaching period will be the 7th of March. Now, that's not to say you can't apply after that date, but what it does mean is that you'll potentially get rolled in to our further teaching period, which I think starts on the 22nd of July. In terms of CSP placements, there's been a lot of questions that have been bounced around. We do have a limited availability of CSP places, which are still available for you to um, apply for right now. But again, this isn't something that's just blanket and they may not be potentially available going forward in the rest of the teaching period. But that doesn't mean that it won't be available for the next teaching period. There's just some factors in the background that can move slightly. So like I would say apply and hopefully you'll be successful. I think that's pretty much about the application process and the enrollment process. Um, as I said, as the rest of the speakers have said, happy to answer any questions that you may have. We've got quite a few questions that have come up in the chat. Um, so we'll try and get around to some of those. But any other ones you have, feel free to email us, contact us, and we'll proactively try and answer some of these as well. So let's move on to the Q&A. So I think quite a few have been answered in the chat. Um, I know that the CSP online, if it's available full time or part time, has definitely been added. Um, there was one question around CSP if it's available to permanent residents or only Australian citizens. I think I'm afraid it's only available to Australian and New Zealand citizens, but I'd like any of the panel to step in and correct me if I'm wrong there. Or not, Genevieve, it looked like you might say something there. Apologies. I'm just, just checking the um the details from the government's website because naturally we follow the eligibility requirements um from the, the federal government. So you need to be an Australian citizen, a New Zealand citizen, or an Australian permanent visa holder, um, or an eligible for, former permanent humanitarian visa holder. Um, so I think. Uh, we'd be happy to speak with people individually if they've got unusual circumstances there. Thank you for that. I hope me. that helps. Um, we have another question here, which says, in order to pursue online, can we pursue being present outside of Australia, being an AU citizen? And I'm assuming that means, are we able to study if we're an Australian citizen, but offshore? I can address that to some degree, Mark. Would you like me to do that? Please do, Belinda. Um, so the, the issue with that is that we've had some experience of this. Occasionally, some students um, who've been studied online with our previous provider we're working overseas. Um, the problem that can arise is in Europe, um, the GDPR, which I'm not quite sure if, if you all know what that is, but it's very strict data requirements um, that Europe, that the EU has. And if they are sitting in Europe and we run the exam for Monash, there's um, a Monash online provide the invigilated exam environment at the moment. Um, we we can't be com compliant with that. So you'd have to come to Australia to do the exams. And then there are other issues, again, with some countries that block, um, that block RMIT, um, such as uh, mainland China. So we can't guarantee that. So there's nothing to actually stop you but um, you would probably need to write the exam um, in Australia. And the other problem you're going to find is that your tutorials are at 3 a.m. in the morning, um, which, you know, is, is not ideal. But it's not to say that it's impossible, but those are, in fact, um, the obstacles. That's great. I feel like that provides some clarity. Thank you, Belinda. Um, we have another question here, which I think potentially was answered in the chat. Um, and it was around, if the qualification is recognised, 
in other states. Maybe I can direct that one to you, Genevieve. Well, I'm happy to answer it as well. If did, um... Yeah, go ahead, Belinda. Um, yes, so we sometimes have people from other jurisdictions coming to us to study. And what happens is that they ask VLAB, which is the Victorian Legal Admissions Board. Um, and usually what happens is that the, the typical Australian subjects, constitutional law, um, Australian company law, um, they have to retake in Australia. So for other common law jurisdictions, such as the UK, um, you would need to have your qualifications assessed and there'd be um, contractors usually accepted. Um, there's just a couple of specific ones um, that you would have to um, attack. And that's true of all the common law jurisdictions in the, um, Malaysia. Um, your qualification, we do have mutual recognition with New Zealand. And of course, the Victorian one is recognised in all other states of Australia. Thank you, Belinda. Um, we have another question here, which says the options for term three are pretty limited at the moment. Will there be more options added as the year progresses and in different years? I'm happy to answer that um, initially. So at the moment, we do have a relatively limited number of um, offerings in that third teaching period. Because this is the first time we've brought this program into RMIT online from um, Open Universities Australia, we have got that um, more limited set of courses. Um, we are looking to potentially, though, increase the number of offerings at that time in future. Um, it really depends a bit on um, the kind of demand and the number of students we've got. Um, so far, the, the response to opening this up through RMIT Online has been really positive. So we're really hopeful of being able to offer more options um, in that third teaching period in future. You're on mute, Mark. That should have just come off, sorry about that. Um, I've seen a question here, which I think is a pretty common uh, misconception. And it's around, is the JD the same content as the Bachelor of Law? Or are the outcomes different? I believe I can answer that as well. <laughs> so the, the JD is a master's level degree. So although, um, so both of them lead to admission to practice as a lawyer, but the undergraduate LLB is taught as um, at a different level, a different AQF, um, which is academic level. So um, you will find that the JD assessments will be longer, there'll be more research-based, um, just generally conduct um, taking place at master's level. But so that makes a difference if, for instance, you want to be an academic, if, for instance, um, it's, it also means you're enhancing your existing primary graduation, uh, sorry, your uh, qualification. Um, but both lead to practice. The LLB is, in fact, easier than the JD. Um, but it's not available for postgraduates, only available for undergraduate. Um, so I hope that answers that. I think it does. Thank you. Um, we have another one here. Does RMIT provide info on each brand guest speaker to assist in choosing the right path and the most useful electives? Would love to hear from specifics from people working in different areas of law. Um, so I guess I can speak to a part of that. So our enrollment team are pretty well versed to be able to guide people in the direction that they might want to go. Um, in terms of brand and guest speakers, I'm not sure how common or frequently that occurs along the course. Um, so maybe Anitra or someone else might be able to speak to that. Um. I could say something about that. We, um, we're we happy to let you know what our electives are about, but it's not, um, the guest speaker 
by the time you enroll, um, the guest speaker is basically um, very much a within semester uh, sort of event. So all information that you need about the elective is directed towards the academics um, at RMITO basically. We can answer uh, questions that you might have in relation to that. Okay, thank you, Brenda. Um, another question we have here, are there or would there be opportunities to pick up casual work in the legal field while doing the course or would you have to wait until graduation? I could say a few words to that as well. Um, we have a number of people, particularly in the JD, who I'd say about half are doing it part-time. Some of them are already working as paralegals. Some are working in their existing career. Um, we also, what we do is we often get um, internships. Um, we get, I, in fact, I posted one up uh, yesterday to have a uh, internship um, 34 hours a year at the legal council of Australia, the law council of Australia. So lots of little things come up, but again, um, one of the things in a law degree is really important is to make sure you constantly network, whether it's with your fellow students who are going to be your future colleagues, whether it's the, um, the alumni or all the events that we put on. Um, we do hope to put on virtual events for you as well, and any face-to-face -face events, you know, you're, you'd of course be um, very welcome. I think the main thing that to take on board is it's really important as lawyers to build your network. Um, so make sure you're using LinkedIn, making sure you connect with everybody else. Um, it's very much a, um, a sort of responsibility as a you know, as part of developing your law career. But I will say that a lot of people do pick up work here and there as they go along. Of course, you can't give advice to a client until you are admitted and you are, um, you know, properly indemnified and insured and all that sort of thing. Um, but definitely there's lots of opportunities for, for building your legal profile. Thank you for that, Belinda. Uh, we have a couple of questions here that kind of align, so I might group them together. Uh, one is around, does everybody have to take the exams at the same time? And the second part to that question is, are the exams online or face-to-face? -face? Yeah, I'm happy to um, speak to that. So because it's an invigilated exam, the system is, the first exam is set at the same time, and in fact, it's exactly the same time for face-to-face -face and online students, it's the same exam. Um, within RMIT, there are two options to take a deferred exam, and those are very specific circumstances um, under special consideration. They list specific grounds, illness, um, unavoidable work commitments, and then that Second possibility, it's not you're not entitled to it. It's just if you qualify under SpecCon, that would take place at the same time during the deferred period. And um, should un, uh, unusual circumstances arise again, there'll be a third and final opportunity to do the exam in the next deferred period. Um, and so after that, um, if you're not able to sit the exam, you can apply for late academic withdrawal without um, late academic withdrawal without penalty. But essentially, you'll have to take the course again after that. So essentially, there's a balance between um, finality and you completing the course, and us understanding that sometimes uh, extenuating extent, um, circumstances might arise but generally the exam takes place at the same time um yeah so i think uh, that's that's basically it for exams and that's the same policy throughout rmit great thanks again belinda um we have a question here around differentiation so how does the rmi law rmit law program different 
or differentiate to other universities? Would you like um, me to start? And then Belinda, perhaps you can pick up. So I guess um, some of the key things that we would say are different about the RMIT program compared with other institutions. Uh, potentially the, the level of engagement with industry is a key area where we really distinguish ourselves. Um, and Belinda's spoken a bit about um, guest speakers, the advisory board, the opportunities to do things like internships, um, which really give you that opportunity to make sure that um, you're getting really well prepared for um, roles within the field. Um, another area where we're different is through the range of electives that we have. Um, so they're really designed to provide opportunities for you to follow an area of interest um, and also be really prepared for interesting areas of law that you might want to move into in future. So Tim mentioned moving into um, an area in environmental law. Um, we've got courses in that space that are electives that might be of interest for you, or there's other areas as well that um, potentially line up with um, future areas um, for you in your career. Um, and I think having a structure where you can have semesters plus an optional semester um, over the summer period also gives you that flexibility that um, a lot of people really want when they're learning online and potentially have other responsibilities as well. So you can accelerate your learning if you wish, but there's also the flexibility to go a bit more slowly if you need to do that as well. Um, so there's a couple of things from my, um, my side. Maybe Belinda, if you wanted to add, you're welcome to as well. Um, yes, I can say a couple of things. So we've said this before, but it bears repeating. All law schools in Australia have to meet um, standards because there's, in fact, um, legislation that says what a law school, the competencies students have to do. When we talk about the priestly 11 subjects, contract, criminal evidence, that's what we're talking about. So every law school in Australia that's accredited has to meet that standard. After that, law schools dis distinguish themselves in different ways. The way we distinguish ourselves at RMIT is, as Genevieve mentioned, we've got a strong commitment um, to career and work integrated learning. But also something about our law school is that we aren't a very big law school and we're quite pastorally focused. So certainly as you get towards the end, um, you know, we pretty much know our students, we support them. And other law schools are much bigger. For instance, the intake is much larger at University of Melbourne. Um, so we tend to have um, a focus on that. Um, our focus is also as well on social impact. We have researchers working in that area, for instance, business and human rights. Um, we also have uh, and we've in fact got the Business and Human Rights Centre where we have academics who work on that all the time. Other area that we're different or that we put our focus in is law and technology. And RMIT's got a globally famous um, law and, uh, not law, but um, blockchain hub where we have researchers who work in the social impact of, of that type of regulation. So those are just, um, and also environment, we've also got academics who work there. So that's just um, uh, part of it. And of course, we've got the Centre for Innovative Justice, which also speaks to that um, impact, which is also a core RMIT value. So if anyone can uh, think of anything else, um, but that's just off the top of my head, um, how, our, how we sort of position our particular law school. That was great. Thanks, Belinda and Genevieve. Um, and I think the last question that we'll have time for is around fees. So there's a question here that says, if I fail in an exam, do I need to repay the fees? Not 100% clear on that, but maybe someone can speak to that. Yeah, I can speak to that. Um, so it's quite a complicated um, thing. So if at any time you are not able to um, complete an assessment, the course co coordinator will generally have up to seven days discretion. Um, after that, you need to apply to special consideration. And as I said, that will be you know, unexpected events. 
However, there's another thing as well, is if you've got an ongoing condition um, that you know about that's long term, you can have an appointment with Equitable Learning Services and they will prepare a um, equitable learning plan that makes sure you're not disadvantaged. So that covers off any long-term issues you might have submitting assessments, whatever type of assessment they are, you know, exams, obviously, um, are the things that, that sort of get people um, stressed out the most. Um, but if it's an unexpected situation, then there's SpecCon and then the, there's those two deferred um, opportunities. But having said all of that, if after all of that, and you've been given those opportunities um, and you haven't done it through, you're then obliged to take the course again and pay again, because of course RMIT is incurring the same, um, is incurring, you know, it's, it's not cheaper for them. It's just another student, you know, if, if you see what I'm saying, it's not, um, if it's not our fault, then that's sort of the way it works. Um, but the other thing as well is perhaps Genevieve will be able to speak to this. Um, there's a, a date by which you can withdraw without incurring a financial penalty. So say you enroll, you've enrolled in three courses, and I can actually say perhaps um, we do find students can often over-enroll in because they don't quite realise how, you know, these are quite demanding subjects. Do take a note of census date because you can think, look, I've enrolled in three courses, I've got work, I'm only going to manage to. And if you withdraw before census date, um, then there's no financial pen penalty. So it's just a matter of being aware of the processes and just being careful to manage your time. It was great. Thank you very much to all of our esteemed panelists. Um, as I said, there was a lot of questions. Um, but we are about to wrap up for time. So please do not hesitate to contact us um, on 0300-145-032 or you can email us, email us at sales at rmitonline.edu.au um, or if there's any questions that we can scoop off of here before and proactively answer, then we will be in touch. Hope you found this session valuable and I hope you have a great rest of your Tuesday. Thanks again.